So you think you like mushrooms? Well, this man Bing. has cultivated hundreds and thousands of mushrooms from dozens of species, teaching himself how to turn them into extracts, tinctures, and even DNA barcoding them. I am that I am. I'm a 94 model human. They call me William Padilla Brown, multidisciplinary citizen scientist, founder of Microsymbiotics and Mycofest. How many mushrooms do you think you've grown or cultivated? Like individual mushrooms? Yeah. Holy sheesh, man. I believe I've cultivated about 38 species of mushrooms. I can't even go outside saying I run a mushroom business without somebody saying, oh, what kind of mushrooms? Or like asking about magic mushrooms or something like that. You know, my response is, all mushrooms are magic. In the pursuit of the magic of fungi, William has to take his work far from the hum of electric lights. We're here in central Pennsylvania in one of these beautiful hemlock dominant forests on the Appalachian Range along the Susquehanna River. We can find really good specimens out here that we can bring back to our lab to increase our genetic diversity that we have available to our farmers here in the U.S. These are coral mushrooms. Some people call these the crown tip coral, but there's a lot of species variation in this type of mushroom. These are saprophytic mushrooms. They'll generally grow on dead and dying materials like these logs. Some cultures and some people will eat these. I've not eaten this one. They look cool though. I think that there has been a fear of mushrooms. I think there's a lot of people that think mushrooms are like toxic. The more you spend time with something that you think is weird, the more it becomes something that you understand. William continues to eye the forest floor as he hikes, his vision attuned to spotting these small natural marvels at a distance. We're looking at a display of golden thread cordyceps is the common name. Yeah, there you go, you can see it was growing on this little truffle ball. For certain mushrooms, we carry them around in bags like this so that their spores are released. I designed this bag with a friend so that it's completely mesh and all the spores can come out. Spores are the reproductive cells of mushrooms. Super tiny. They're really good at getting around and about on their own. Here we have Lactiflus volimus. This is a delicious choice edible of the summer season here in Pennsylvania. I like to make chili with these. These mushrooms are really fun because if you cut them along the gills, you'll see that they start to produce a latex, but when you cook it, it all kind of just uh, goes away. What he's found so far today is just a fraction of the mushrooms William cultivates. Turkey tail mushrooms, Trimedes versicolor. These mushrooms can be found all around the world. These mushrooms are called versicolor because they have a variety of colors that you can find on the top, but they will generally be white on the bottom unless they are starting to get a little bit old. These mushrooms are highly valued for their immunological support. Here we have our local reishi, Ganoderma suge, grows on the hemlock tree. This is known as the mushroom of immortality and used in teas and valued for its antioxidant effects. We got our good old oyster mushrooms. These are one of the more commonly cultivated mushrooms by hobbyists and citizen scientists because of how easily it takes to growing on all sorts of different substrates. From coffee grounds to cardboard, oyster mushroom is your guy. Wow, this place is popping. As William continues to forage, he's about to make an exciting discovery. So this is exactly what we were looking for. Cordyceps militaris is the most valuable mushroom that I can come in here and leave with. I could leave with dinner, but I can leave with this mushroom, which we can take back to our laboratory, breed out new cultures for people to farm. So we can create value for ourselves. Other people can create value for their families a lot more than just taking home a couple mushrooms for a meal. These mushrooms are entomopathogenic, which means that they grow on insects. We generally find them on moth pupa here in Pennsylvania, generally the orange tip oak worm moth. So we want to dig that whole thing up. You can actually get a clone of the mushroom from the insect because the insect is like completely mummified in mycelium. Sick. Great foray. We found exactly what we were looking for. I got two different types of cordyceps and a little bit of food. So we can take everything back to the lab. I can get some nice clones, get some spores going. We can start growing and uh, doing some business. Spotting and harvesting mushrooms may seem second nature to William. Yay! But his deep well of insight and knowledge didn't happen overnight. When I was 16, I dropped out of high school. And when I was 17, I got my own apartment. Around that time, I found it very imperative to understand the source of what I was consuming. And wanting to know where my food came from, I began cultivating organic food. I started to see mushrooms and play with them, figure out how to grow them. Because at that point in time, I was a vegan. 
I realized that I was developing a literacy around mycology that not many people had. So I took that information, started to gather as much as I could and made myself very publicly accessible so that I could share it with other people and develop more literacy around mycology so that I could have more nerds to hang out with. All of his study and dedication has led William into a scientific familiarity with fungi that allows him to see and study what most people cannot. William has to be very precise as he processes samples from his foraging finds, neatly dissecting and pulling what he needs with delicacy. Before COVID, we were already using masks in here because you breathe out a lot of organisms out of your mouth and your nose that it could potentially contaminate the work that you're doing. So if you're wondering if your mask works or not, it does. You'll get bacteria on your petri dishes. The mycelium in the insect is dense and the mycelium in the, the mushroom are just very small to get a piece of mycelium out of. So I'm gonna take this scalpel, get it in the sterilized. It only needs to be in there for a few moments. And I'm gonna put my cordyceps sample onto the alcohol paper towel. Gently mist it with some isopropyl alcohol. This was in the soil, so there's like a lot of organisms on it. I'm going to slice it in half long ways. So what I'm doing now is I'm just going for some of this inner tissue, which for cordyceps is very little. It's just a little bit difficult when the mushroom is so tiny. That's all I need. Nature's technology is incredible. This little bit of tissue has enough to replicate the entire organism. Cloning and growing mushrooms is complicated enough as it is, but William's recent study is into the DNA of mushrooms themselves. I discovered that there are now portable DNA sequencers and that is incredible. I got super inspired and I used one of the stimulus checks to purchase one and then I spent a month teaching myself how to work with polymerase chain reaction, gel electrophoresis, and DNA sequencing. Now that these things are becoming more commonplace, we're going to reach a different type of awareness that this is just a story. All life is just a story. And William continues telling these stories through his research into mushrooms and exploration of the mushroom community. I hope that my work encourages more people to take their education into their own hands and start to operate from a more decentralized standpoint like the mycelium does. The mycelium doesn't just put all of its energy into the center, it's all distributed throughout. And I think that this way is more resilient as an individual that looks to mimic nature, mimic natural designs that have been perfected over millions of years. I think that working with these types of systems that we see with the mushrooms may prove to be very effective for some of our human systems that have been very flawed.